Amen. Uh, I'll just let me just offer a couple words here, just uh, words of gratitude uh, and thanks, Stephen. Here you go. These are these are your notes here. Um, Thank you. Words of gratitude and thanks. I've been at New Life now for 15 years, and 10, year, 10 of those years have been as the lead pastor, and uh, I'm just really grateful to God. I'm, I'm grateful for a remarkable predecessor in Pete Scazzaro, who's been uh, the most significant mentor of my life, and. Um, Pete, if you're watching this, I love you with a deep love, and I'm uh, so grateful for you and the continued influence you have in my life. Uh, I'm grateful for the love and support. The last 10 years has been a great gift and has been very challenging, very challenging, and uh, God has been faithful through all of that. And uh, more than anything, I'm grateful for Rosie and Rosie's love and Rosie's support. Uh, She has served our church faithfully in ways that are seen, in ways that are not seen, in some remarkable, remarkable ways. And um, if you've heard any good humor from my sermons, it's Rosie's uh, <laughs> giving it to me. If you've heard any sermons that changed from one service to the next and it got better, it's because Rosie said, take that story out and insert this one here. And so, uh, and, uh, and to echo Judith's prayer, I'm, honey, I'm looking forward to seeing your gifts come alive in some fresh ways that our congregation desperately needs to receive from you. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, How about a sermon? Uh, Let's go into that there. We're in a series right now, and if you're watching online, uh, welcome to this moment here. My name is Rich. I'm the lead pastor at New Life. And uh, whether you're watching on Facebook, newlife.nyc, or YouTube, or whether you're in the room for the first time, just glad that you're here. At the end of our service, after you get your cupcake, Uh, And you can get your express cupcakes through that door there. That's the express way to the cupcakes. So go through down that door, and then I'm going to be in the lobby area. I'd love to meet you if we've never met before. So if this is your first time here, uh, please stop by and uh, introduce yourself. But we are in a series entitled Life Beneath the Surface. Life Beneath the Surface, building a strong spirituality without denying our humanity. Building a strong spirituality without denying our humanity. It is very easy uh, in the church to deny our humanity in the name of Jesus, to deny parts of us uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, But what Jesus invites us into is not a spirituality that denies our humanity, but one that integrates our humanity in our life with God. And my hope over the course of this series is to cover a number of different things, but, but hopefully that this will be the fruit of our time together, that we would all grow in naming and recognize and managing our own feelings. Uh, not managing the feelings of others, take note, Uh, that we would grow in praying our feelings, that we would grow in our capacity to be present to others and their feelings, that we would grow in discerning the deeper messages beneath our emotions. And and in other words, it's, it's holding together a spirituality that connects to our emotional life. My predecessor said it this way, and this has become one of the more important phrases in the life of our church, that emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. That is, it is impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature, which is to say we can memorize all of the Bible passages and go to church every single Sunday. Sunday, but if we don't know how to navigate the terrain of our interior life, if we don't know how to integrate our joys and our sadness and our grief and our fear in our relationship to faith, it's not an indication of our spiritual maturity, but our spiritual immaturity. No matter how much Bible we know, amen, no matter how many times we go to church, no matter how many times we volunteer, if we don't know how to integrate our interior life with our exterior life, it's an indication of our spiritual immaturity not our spiritual maturity and so this is our hope that we would grow in our relationship with God and grow in our relationship with one another and today we're going to focus on the topic of anger the topic of anger that's what we're going to touch on which felt a little strange it's like 10 year anniversary and then I'm going to talk about anger but then I think about it you know on Mother's Day I preached about lust and so uh whatever all right we're, we're whatever Uh, And so we're going to talk about anger today, and anger is such an important topic, uh, and in the church, it's a very complicated thing, very complicated thing. Uh, And some homes that we grew up in, some of you uh, did not have permission to be angry. That was one of the emotions that your parents said, you better not demonstrate that, you better not display that. And yet for others of us, we grew up in a home in which all we saw was anger. 
destructive anger in our world. And so we all come into this church and come into this gathering today under the hearing of God's word with a particular viewpoint on anger. And I believe this is one of the most important areas to really get a hold on. What does God call us to do with our anger? What does Jesus invite us into with as it relates to our anger? And the degree, the question is not whether we have it or not. The question is, to what degree has it influenced your life? And so even as we look at God's word today, I want you to think about this for a second. What are you angry about? What has made you angry in recent days? What has so just uh, brought out a sense of anger in your soul? I want you to hold on to that. Because God has something to say to us out of Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse number 20. If you have a Bible, you can follow along with me in there or on your device, or you can follow as well on the screen. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse number 20, hear the word of the Lord. Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, Jesus is doing something very profound here. He's basically saying, that's what Moses said, but I'm the new Moses here. I'm giving you a deeper reality here. You've heard it said, you shall not murder, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with the brother or sister, will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift, notice what Jesus does here, and we're going to pick this up. He talks about anger, and then he takes us to a worship service. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak deep down to our souls today. Lord, thank you for the gift of Holy Scripture, the gift of this community, the gift of the body of Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I pray now that you will give us ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to receive every gift you have for us this day. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Amen. People have said that to be truly angry is really an experience of brief insanity. To be truly angry is to have an experience of brief insanity. And over the course of my years, I've had many moments of brief insanity. I think about when I was young, maybe 12 years or so, my, my younger brother Jason and I would play video games, and, uh, and sometimes I'd beat him, then he'd beat me, and when he beat me in the video game, he always had something to say to me after he beat me. And he'd beat me and, and say something, and then he would run, and, okay, and I'd be so angry, and he would run and close the door. I remember one day I was so angry, I, he showed that, and I just punched at the glass door that we had and just shattered it. I covered it with curtains so that my mom didn't find out about it until like three months later. But in that moment, I realized, what was that inside of me that I just punched the glass and shattered it? About seven years later, a relationship had come to an end, a relationship that I invested a lot of time and energy and my $22 bank account in. I was just like 19 years old, and and that relationship came to an end. I remember one day, I was just so angry that the relationship came to an end that I took a frame that was in my room, and I just tossed it against the room, and glass shattered again all over the place. And I thought to myself, what is that inside of me? Fast forward about maybe seven years, I'm about 26 years of age, I'm driving on the FDR. And someone's behind me, and there's plenty of space, two other lanes around me, but this person wants to tailgate me and wants me to move. And so at the closer he gets and he starts flashing the lights, I put my brakes on. I go, okay, you gonna do that? I'm gonna put my brakes on now. And so he gets in front of me and cuts me off. 
And for about two exits, I chased this person down as close as I possibly could, brief insanity. And I thought to myself, what in the world am I doing here? Am I the only one in this house here that has it? Pray for your pastor, okay? Pray for your pastor. To be angry from time to time is a moment of brief insanity. And what I know about the, the human experience is this. At some point or another, we have all had a moment of brief insanity. We have anger all over our culture. Anger uh, pervades our world. Spouses are angry at each other. Employees are angry at their bosses. Citizens are angry at their government. Teenagers are angry at their parents. And parents are angry at their teenagers. We are angry and live in a culture of anger about things that we cannot change. And we know what it's like to be angry with ourselves. Angry about decisions that we make, regrets that we have in our lives. And we live in a culture that is increasingly angry, and not just increasingly angry, we live in a culture that in many ways rewards and, and amplifies anger. In 2021, there was a study done around social media, the tweets that go most viral. What are the tweets, what are the posts that go most viral in our society? And this study found out that the tweets and the posts and the social media stuff that goes viral are the tweets that are filled with outrage and anger. What are the, what are the messages that get amplified most? The ones that are filled with outrage and with anger. And so people have learned this and have built an identity on outrage. People have learned this and have built a brand on anger. People have learned this, and instead of working for goodness and wholeness and justice in the world, people know how to point out only what's wrong with no solutions therein and just fuels the anger that so permeates our society. And so this anger permeates our society left and right. Look no further than what's happening in the Middle East right now. The level of anger, the level of violence, the level of rage that's impacting our lives, impacting our world. And what we're going to learn about anger today in the scriptures, particularly in Matthew chapter 5, are two specific things. That anger can be, if we let it, a redemptive gift, or anger can be a destructive power. Anger can be a redemptive gift. Or anger can be a destructive power. And this is what Jesus has to say to us. He offers some very strong words about the role of anger in our interior life and what Jesus wants us to do in light of it. When Jesus begins this passage in the Sermon on the Mount, this particular aspect, he begins by saying that our righteousness, the righteousness of followers of Jesus, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, he has a word for you today. Our righteousness is to go deeper than the righteousness of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were the, 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 the elite religious professionals. They were re the religious leaders of the day who knew more of the Bible than anyone else, who volunteered more than anyone else, who observed the holiness codes more than anyone else. If the, the Pharisees looked like they were really close to God because they always were at church, they memorized the scriptures, they were generous with their money, but Jesus looks at his disciples and says, if you're going to be my follower, your righteousness is going to have to be deeper than that of the Pharisees. And when people looked at Jesus, they probably said, how can this be possible? Because we'll never know the Bible like the Pharisees. We will never be holy like the Pharisees. We will never know the traditions like the Pharisees. And what Jesus is asking and inviting his followers into is not to do more than the Pharisees. What he's inviting us to do is to go deeper than the Pharisees. He's not telling us to do more. He's inviting us to go deeper. That the Pharisees have a righteousness, but it's a righteousness that's external. The Pharisees have a righteousness, but it's a righteousness that doesn't really impact the heart. The Pharisees have a righteousness, but the, the righteousness doesn't go really beneath the surface. And so Jesus understands that you could have a lot of religious observance and not be transformed. We can do all the right things at church and not be transformed. We can have all the external things right, but not truly be transformed. And so Jesus makes a contrast. He said, you have heard it said, but I tell you. 
Jesus is, he's, he's assuming that people have heard particular things, but he's trying to give the deeper teaching that Moses really intended when he gave the Ten Commandments in the first place. You've heard it said, you shall not commit murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says you fool will be danger of the fire of hell. This is trouble for us who drive on Queens Boulevard, okay? I just want to tell you right now. Up to this point, the Pharisees listened and obeyed the teachings of Moses. Moses said, Do not murder. And the Pharisees thought, as long as we're not killing anyone, as long as we're not murdering anyone, we're doing just fine. And Jesus said, not so in my kingdom. Because for, the, for Jesus, the standards for his life and his kingdom is not don't kill. It's deeper than that. The standards is not don't murder anyone. For Jesus, the standard is about what's really going on in our heart because Jesus knows that we can murder someone in our minds. Jesus knows we can kill someone in our hearts. And what Jesus is after is not simply our external observance. He's after the very transformation of our souls. And so Jesus says, you have heard it said, don't, be, don't murder, but I tell you, don't be angry. Now, when you read the Bible and you pay attention to the life of Jesus, you make a discovery. And the discovery that you make is that there were times in the New Testament that Jesus was angry. And so, what do we do with this? Either Jesus doesn't practice what he preaches, or there's a different way of seeing anger. For example, in John chapter 2, uh, Jesus, after he uh, makes water turn into wine, he goes into the temple where people are being taken advantage of. Poor people are being taken advantage of. People are selling sacrifices to people and making money hand over fist, taking advantage of these people. And Jesus walks into the temple, and the Bible says that he makes a whip, and he shoes them out. Now, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say he hit them with the whip. It doesn't say that. But he uses the whip to shoo them out of the temple and says, "You, my, my father's house is to be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. He's angry that poor people are being taken advantage of. And so how do we understand it? When we look at Jesus and his anger, it is fueled out of a concern for justice for people who have been mistreated. It's not oriented towards himself. Jesus is not angry because his ego has been bruised. He's angry because poor people have been taken advantage of. And so, and what we see here in, in Jesus is that anger can actually be a redemptive gift when it is stewarded and directed to work for justice, especially towards people who have been maligned and marginalized and ostracized. It's a redemptive gift. And what Jesus wants to do for some of us in this room here is to highlight and to have us access the anger in our souls, especially when things are not right with the world. I remember a professor who told me, if you're not angry you're not paying attention that there's so much to be angry about that there's so much in our world that there's justification to be angry about blessed are those who recognize that there's something not right with the world and blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness Blessed are those who can identify the ways that sin infects our society. Blessed are those who recognize people who have been oppressed. Blessed are those who recognize people who have been on the receiving end of injustice. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are those who use their anger in such a way to creatively work for shalom. Amen to creatively work for a world that's marked by the peace and the rule and the compassion and the mercy of God. 
And so in one way, anger can be a redemptive gift. And for some of us, we need to tap into that. But what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 5 is another side of anger. It's anger as a destructive power. Jesus says, whoever gets angry. Now, if you hear that, it's like, whoa, because I was angry yesterday. This is a problem here. But when Jesus says anger, there's a particular kind of anger he's talking about. In Greek, the word anger there is the word orgazomenos, orgazomenos. Whoever is angry, the word is orgazomenos. And it's actually a present tense word that really connotes this. It's about carrying anger, remaining angry, nursing a grudge. It's a present tense word. It's you nurturing the anger. It's you saying, I was hurt and I'm going to hold on to this anger as long as I possibly can. And Jesus understands something, that the more we live with orgazomenos, that kind of anger, it actually destroys our souls. Because it's a kind of, it, it morphs into bitterness, it morphs into resentment. And you know what resentment is? It's drinking rat poison and expecting the rat to die. It's, 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 a, it's a way of life that so consumes us. And Jesus says, this is the kind of anger that we must release. Dallas Willard, the great philosopher, theologian, said that the kind of anger that Jesus is talking about is anger that is dedic energy is dedicated to keeping the anger alive. Energy is dedicated to keeping the anger alive. And so what happens is it starts weighing on you little by little by little. It reminds me, when I go to the grocery store, there are times that I have my cart and I get, put everything in the cart. And there are times where I go, I just need a few items, and I grab the hand cart. And I walk in, and I, and I grab the milk, and then I go, ooh, what's this? And I grab some cookies, and ooh, what's this here? And, and grab some cereal that Rosie said I should not be having. And then next thing you know, I got to get this. Ooh, I better pick this up here. And little by little, I'm walking down here with the, you ever been there before? It's just like, and you're so far from the cart that you just got to carry all the way uh, to the register. That's orgazomenos. That little by little. The anger that we carry, the anger that we nurture, the energy that we use to keep anger alive begins to weigh us down. And Jesus says, when it weighs you down, it leads to something called raka. Orgazomenos weighs you down to the point where raka emerges from our souls. And that word raka, we don't use raka in our day but we use it in our day. Because that word raka is really calling someone a particular word with a particular disposition of contempt. So it's not just a word. It's not just, come on, fool. It's not that. It is full with a level of animosity, a level of contempt. It's, 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 it's helpful that when Jesus says raka, it, it, he's, he's basically, there was a time in our country, and still is today for that matter, when people use the N-word against black people with a level of contempt, with a level of hostility, with a level of corrosive power. This is what Jesus is getting at, at the core. And what Jesus understands is that if we hold on to orgazomenos, to that anger, it'll lead to us exploding and sinning against others. And this is what I know to be true about the world we live in. We live in a raka world. We are infected by a raka world. You voted for Joe Biden? Raka. You voted for Donald Trump? Raka. You support LGBTQ people? Raka. You come alongside immigrants? Raka. You're a Yankees fan? <laughs> Raka. You see a picture of your ex husband on Facebook? Raka, Raka, Raka. I mean, we live in a society that's marked by Raka. Here's the question Who have you been saying Raka to? When you turn on the news, where has Raqqa 
been emerging in your life. And Jesus says, if we allow the orgazomenos to turn into raka, we are going to live lives that are marked by corrosion. It's going to eat away at our soul. And so anger can be a redemptive gift or anger is a destructive power. And I wonder what it's like for you today. Where in your life are you stewing on it? Where in your life are you holding on to resentment? You're giving energy to it. You're you're not journaling about it to offer it to God. You're journaling about it to remind yourself of just how angry you are about it. You're not doing it to offer and say, God, do something with it. You're doing it so that you can feel it again and again and again. Jesus says the orgazomenos will turn to raka and your soul will be contaminated. Now, this is what I know to be true. There are legitimate reasons to be angry in our world. There are legitimate reasons... I know a lot of your stories. There are legitimate reason for you to be angry. For some of us, we've come from abusive, dysfunctional homes. And you feel the anger that you feel is justified. You see, you see the racism that's come your way, and you feel the anger is legitimate to feel that. The poverty, the, the level of dysfunction, you feel it, you feel it, you feel it, and there is legitimate reality to it. I think about what James Baldwin said in the 1960s. He said that to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. This is the 1960s. To feel anger is legitimate. To feel anger makes a lot of sense. There are legitimate reasons to be angry, but this is what Jesus is saying. In the kingdom of God, There is no legitimate reason to let that anger destroy you. You could feel it. It's legitimate for you. You've been betrayed. It's legitimate to feel anger. You've been sinned against. It's it's right to feel anger. Something, um, um, some injustice came your way. It's right to feel angry. And Jesus says, in the kingdom of God, there's no legitimate reason to let that anger consume you. And so in in the book of Ephesians says, be angry and sin not. Be angry, feel it, but don't allow the evil one to use that anger in you in such a way that it corrodes your soul. And what Jesus does here is he says, I want to help you understand the connection between anger and your relationship to God. Because if we are carrying resentment and anger and bitterness, you can be sure it's impacting your relationship with God. So look what Jesus does. He says, you have heard it said, don't be angry, but I tell you, if anyone is angry, or don't murder, but if anyone who's angry, you've already, you're going down a bad path. And then in a moment, Jesus switches the scene to a worship service. And look what he does here. It's strange because he just talked about anger, and then he says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and, there is, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar first and go be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Look, look how strange this sounds. Jesus just said, don't murder you have heard it said, but I tell you, don't be angry. And by the way, if you're at the, if you're at the temple um, before you offer your gift uh, and you find out that there's some orgazomenos happening and some raka between you and someone else, stop whatever you're doing and go to them. And when Jesus tells his story, there's an urgency and an extreme kind of teaching he's giving here because when you understand what it took for someone to get to the altar, you realize what Jesus is asking of them. For someone to make a sacrifice at the altar meant a few things. Number one, they had to travel a long distance. There are no Ubers, there's no subways, there's no anything like that. You've got to travel a long distance to get to the temple. That's a long trip. Then when you get to the temple, you have to wait in a long line to purchase an animal. And after you wait in a long line to purchase an animal, you have to wait in a long line to get to the priest because the priest is going to help you make the sacrifice. You get to the front of the line, and the priest says, it's your turn, come on. Jesus, look at what Jesus says. He says, you're about to give your animal to the priest to make a sacrifice, and then the Holy Spirit reminds you, there's a problem 
with me and so and so. And look what Jesus says. Before you give your sacrifice to the priest, put the animal down. Get off the line. Get out of the temple. Go back home. Find so and so and figure this thing out. Could you imagine? Imagine if Jesus use that same kind of teaching and said, we're going to do that at New Life Fellowship Church as well. You fought through traffic. You got here. You circled around the block forever to find a God-forsaken parking spot. You find your parking spot, someone sitting in your seat. It's your seat. You know it's your seat, but someone is sitting in your seat. You hear the word of God. You've been longing for communion. You've got to take communion. And, and then you get to the bread and the cup, and the Holy Spirit says, stop whatever you're doing right now. Put the bread down. Put the juice down. Get back in your car. Go back in traffic. Find that person who you have raka against and has raka against you and figure this thing out. I wonder if... If we took that seriously, I wonder how many of us have to get up right here, right now. <laughs> I wonder how many of us have to say, well, I, I, I guess I'll have to listen to the sermon later on because I, I got to figure out this thing here. What is Jesus saying? This, it's a foundational principle, and it is this. Jesus is essentially saying that your relationship with God is not as good as you think if you are caring that level of anger against someone. That our relationship with God is not as good as we think if we're stewing on bitterness and resentment. That our relationship with God is not as good as we think if we're allowing orgazomenos to turn into raka. And so what do we do with this? Because from time to time, here's what I know is gonna be true about your story and my story. Someone's gonna hurt you. You're gonna hurt someone. You're going to say something. Someone's going to say something to you. You are going to violate someone's value. Someone's going to violate a value of yours. And you are going to be tempted to carry resentment and tempted to carry bitterness and tempted to carry that orgazomenos that's going to turn into raka sooner or later. If it hasn't hit you in 2023 yet, just stick a while. It says wait a while, okay? At sooner or later, it's going to happen. Why? Because this is what it means to be human. That at some point in our lives, someone is going to have raka against you and you against that person. What do we do with this? And to respond to that, there's a few invitations that I believe God has for us. Jesus wants you to live with interior freedom. It doesn't mean that we're robots. It doesn't mean that we're emotional robots and we can't really feel deeply. But it does mean that we don't allow those feelings to destroy us. And so what does this mean for us? There's three invitations that I gave last week, and I'm going to give them again this week. How do we navigate the anger that lives inside of us? How do we navigate the bitterness, the resentment, the stuff that we've been stewing on for a long time? Three invitations. Number one, we must pay attention to what our anger reveals. Anger is usually a secondary emotion that usually emerges many times out of pride and out of pain. Our ego is shot and anger emerges. Or we are hurt, we're disappointed, we're grieving. Anger is usually a secondary emotion. There's always something beneath the anger. And what we're invited into is whenever you find yourself exploding, whenever you find yourself angry, the question is, what was that about? What's happening beneath the surface? Why was there such a disproportionate response to that? I think about my own life and the ways that I failed as a parent and the ways that anger has emerged out of me as a parent. A couple of years ago, uh, Nathan didn't want to go to school the first week of school. The first two days were fine, and then the next few days he was having a hard time. And the reason he didn't want to go is because at one point he had um, an experience with a bee and uh, they were playing outside. He didn't want to play again outside. A legitimate reason to not want to go to school and play outside. I didn't have this information. All I heard was, I don't want to go to school. And so I, draw, I get to school, and I go, let's go. He goes, I don't want to go. And I go, we got to go. 
I don't want to go. We got to go. I don't want to go. Now, within 30 minutes, I have a podcast interview. I'm being interviewed by someone on a podcast about being a calm presence, okay? Being a, <laughs> this is no lie. Being, Pastor Rich, how can you be a calm presence in the world? And so I go, get out. He goes, I'm not going. I said, get out. No. Get. And I just start, and, I, and anger hits me to the point where I scream so loud, I lose my voice. <laughs> now, I call, at that point, I call Rosie. I say, your son, because at that point, it's her son. <laughs> your son doesn't want to go to school. Rosie says, bring him home. I said, no, I'm not bringing him home. Rosie, because she's like a Jedi master with this stuff there, she brings him home, and she like, she listens to him. <laughs> she asks clarifying questions. She gives him a hug. She goes, you want a lollipop? I know it's so Let me give you a lollipop. And then he goes, this is why I don't want to go, but you're going to be okay. Ten minutes later, he's at school again. He's at school just fine. And then this is what happens. At 9 a.m., Pastor Rich, tell me how you can be a calm presence. And I'm not going to show you the link to the podcast. But my voice is like this the whole time. I lost my voice in the entire podcast. And then after feeling great embarrassment and shame, and like, wow, I got some work to do. I started asking myself a question. Why did I explode in that way? Why did this moment happen? And I realized that the larger thing for me in that moment was I wanted to put on a good face with people. I, wanted, I couldn't tell the guy, can you just wait? I'm having a situation. I'm going to have to wait either 30 minutes or an hour. I, I pride myself on being prompt and being there. I was more concerned about what this person was going to think about me than what my son needed in that moment. And that anger revealed something in me, that I still have wrong priorities here. And whenever you get angry, as you will, if you haven't been angry this week, you're going to get angry at some point this week. And at some point this week or next week, you're going to have a disproportionate reaction to something. The question is, what's beneath it? What's God calling you to pay attention to? We must pay attention to what our feelings reveal. Secondly, we must pray attentively with our feelings. Pray attentively. God is not afraid of your anger. Have you read the Psalms before? I love reading the Psalms. I'm like, finally, somebody understands me. Finally, someone's giving words to really what's going on in my soul. That's why you should read the Psalms on a regular basis. Because someone is helping you articulate what's really happening deep down in your soul. God is not intimidated by your anger. God is not intimidated by your sadness. God is not intimidated by your fear. God knows you better than you know yourself. And so what God invites us to is into honesty and integrity. To pray attentively with our feelings. But it requires also to process our feelings. I think about the violence in our world, the violence in our homes, and so much of the violence emerges because we don't have spaces where we can talk about our anger, where we can say, this is what I'm angry about, and have a space where someone can listen and say, what's going on beneath the surface? Because we don't have that, we hold on to orgazomenos in such a way that it leads to raka. And what we desperately need are people who can help us navigate the anger that lives inside of us. This is why Ron Roheiser, the great theologian, said, when, when evaluating someone's spiritual health, I love his list. There are three things. He says, if you want to evaluate your spiritual health, number one, do I pray every day? Three very simple questions. Do I pray every day? Am I involved with the struggle of the poor? And do I have the kind of friendships in my life that move me beyond bitterness and anger? Do you see what's happening in the world? Do you see the anger, the animosity? You just wait. When this next election cycle emerges, 
Watch what's going to happen. And what Jesus invites us to is not to participate in the destructiveness of anger that permeates our country, that permeates our churches, that permeates our families, that we're called to be different. Why? Because God is different. One of the things I love about God and love about the scriptures, and I'll end with this, let's have the worship team come forward, is there is a phrase that is repeated over and over again, so much so that we're gonna focus on it during the season of Lent. During the season of Lent, we're gonna focus on it for six weeks because it's a phrase that comes up over and over again. And the phrase talks about God being slow to anger and abounding in and steadfast love. That's the God we worship. The God revealed in Jesus Christ is the God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And when you think about the history of Israel in the Old Testament, and you think about the church in the New Testament, those words are so powerful to remember. Because the people of God from, Gen from Genesis to Revelation have a proclivity to be rebellious, have a tendency to turn away from God, have a tendency to say, my kingdom come, my will be done. And over and over again, we find a God profoundly revealed in Jesus Christ who is slow to anger and abounding in love. Some of you came into church today you think about your own inconsistencies, you think about your failures, and you think, God must be so angry with me right now. I haven't been living up to what God expects of me. I haven't been living up to what I expect of myself. And maybe you're holding on, maybe your image of God that you have in your head is God is looking at you with just this scowl of anger, of disappointment, of bitterness and resentment. But we gather as the people of God every Sunday to be reminded that Jesus Christ is the full revelation of God. And Jesus Christ is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God loves you with an everlasting love. He sees your inconsistencies. He sees your disproportionate responses. He sees the stuff that's lodged in your souls and he is slow to anger and he's abounding in love. And he wants to set you free today from the resentment that's eating away at your soul. He wants to set you free today from the bitterness that you've, hold, you've held on for a long time. Some of you are carrying bitterness at your family, your parents. Bitterness at former spouses. Bitterness at neighbors, people at church who hurt you, and you've just been living with that for years. And you know it's done damage to your soul. And Jesus is inviting you today to live in freedom. Why? Because God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he invites us to imitate him in the power of the Spirit. Let's pray together. Jesus, we live in a rocka world a world marked by violence, a world marked by resentment and bitterness. We see it in the Middle East today. We see it in our own nation. We see it in our own families. We see it in our neighborhoods. We see it on the news. And it is so easy to have our lives conform to Orgazomenos and Raqqa. But Holy Spirit, you're here to set the captives free to have us hold on to the kind of anger that leads to creative justice marked by peace and the fruit of the Spirit and to resist the ways of destructive anger that does so much damage to our souls. And so, Spirit of the living God, touch us, heal us, help us, form us. May New Life Fellowship Church be a countercultural community where we don't allow the kind of destructive anger 
to so permeate our community. But may we be people marked by joy and peace and compassion. May we be people who know how to have mature, emotionally healthy conversations. May we be people who demonstrate and give expression to the God who is slow to anger and abounding in love. And so, Lord, we sing to you now words of praise, words of worship, words of gratitude. In the middle of an angry world, we think about your goodness. In the middle of a violent world, we, we meditate on your goodness. In the middle of a world that's marked by Orgazomenos and Raka, we sing of your goodness. And may your goodness, which is pursuing us and following us, may we allow ourselves to be caught by it. And may we offer that to the world around us. We sing to you now in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, let's all stand and let's sing with everything we have inside of us.